Okay, good. Um, okay, well, um, thank you everyone for uh, uh, joining in uh, for this, uh, I guess, uh, sort of televised <laughs> presentation of, of, of what I love to do and uh, what I do um, as a paleo artist. And so my name is Julius Chetany, and I am a paleo artist. So I draw and paint pictures of life from long, long ago, long before humans were on the earth. And um, I also have a scientific background, so I kind of combined the two to make these pictures of prehistoric life and all kinds of life on Earth. Okay. So, uh, so this is not a dinosaur or prehistoric life, right? So uh, this picture is one that I did. It, it kind of brings everything together here. Um, it's a message of kind of helping each other out or uh, mutualism uh, as we like to call it in, in, in the science of ecology, which is one thing I study. This is gonna sort of ring true for most of this um, uh, presentation as one group helping another group out. And that's kind of part of what I find really fun about science and art. They help each other out. Uh, and just like this uh, moth here is helping the plant by pollinating it, and the plant is helping the moth by providing it the, uh, food in the form of seeds, and they help each other out to survive. So it's kind of like that in some ways. I'll get back to that in a second. So science has always fascinated me. I loved science. Uh, science can take you to a whole other world, basically. It can teach us all sorts of amazing things about planets that are far, far away. Like on the right, you see that's Jupiter in the background and moon Amalthea. This is what it would look like if you're standing on one of its little moons. It's a weird place. Or science can take us to worlds that are long, long ago, uh, like, for example, uh, prehistoric times on Earth. And so here you see a picture uh, that I did of the, the moon when uh, one of the great big uh, craters was created on it at the time of the dinosaurs. So this is what I love about science. It can take us to these sort of alien types of worlds that are very different from what it is like today. And some of these worlds um, are right here on, on Earth itself, but we don't normally see them uh, if we walk outside. So one of the things that I studied when I was learning to be a scientist is about the deep ocean. There are places in the deep ocean about a mile below the surface that have these volcanic vents where these hot fluids are flowing from under the surface and they can be hot enough to burn wood if uh, they were on the surface. Uh, and so I studied these and um, we were interested to find out what lives there. You can see little crabs on the surface. And then when we scraped some of the stuff off using a submarine, um, a, I looked at bacteria that were growing there. There's life living there right at the edge of this wild, hot volcanic area. And so this is part of what drove my interest in science is looking at things that we can't just go out and see anywhere, but you have to go and, 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 and like fly to them or, or, or take a submarine to them. And it's a similar sort of thing that interested me about uh, life from long ago. You can't just go out there and take a photograph of what dinosaurs look like or uh, you know, anything from even before the dinosaurs time. And so now I work with a group of scientists called paleontologists who study life from long before um, our species was on the planet. And what I do now is I work with these scientists and I draw and paint pictures for them. Uh, and this is, is helpful because it ends up, we end up helping each other out in that the scientists uh, provide all of this wonderful studies that I can make interesting pictures from and to try to reconstruct what the world looked like um, millions of years ago. And then scientists also benefit from this because the pictures that I create for them uh, are used in the journal articles and the reports that they publish and that helps people to see their work more uh, clearly. And so we kind of help each other out this way. And so this is part of what I really enjoy about the work that I do. I get to work with scientists and to use science in making fun artwork. And then, you know, sometimes it, it appears in different ways too. So for example, uh, the pictures that I create for them don't only go uh, and, and are useful for, for their reports, but 
sometimes we see them in the public as well. So this is a set of four stamps that you might have seen. These are now in circulation in the US. Uh, and they're uh, a set of four stamps uh, featuring a famous Tyrannosaurus Rex that is now in the Smithsonian's National Museum of Natural History, uh, the nation's T-Rex, as it's called. And so um, uh, the United States Postal Service uh, uh, hired me to create these artworks featuring this dinosaur at different stages of its life and after it died in the skeleton. So these are things you can go to any post office and find as well. And they're, they're neat because they change shape when you, you rotate them, so they're lenticular stamps. The other thing I really enjoy doing uh, uh, is uh, illustrating kids' books. And so this is stuff that you can go and find in, in bookstores. Uh, and a lot of these ones are still out there now that I've illustrated. Uh, and I love working on kids' books because I remember when I was a kid and I used to look at pictures of dinosaurs and the prehistoric life that other artists had made, and I really enjoyed that. And so now I enjoy being able to do that, and I feel lucky to be able to do that and to make these available to you guys. And so I've done various kinds of books on, on predators from long ago. Uh, and I also do images, uh, I also paint pictures of, of animals of today. So some of the books I've uh, illustrated feature like large uh, insects or spiders. Uh, there's one on, uh, on, on all of these creepy crawlies out there, and I like to select species that are weird and unusual, things that you wouldn't normally find, like these funny little jumping spiders that make dances, uh, or, or strange metallic beetles with frog legs, or these, these giraffe-like beetles that fly, really, really weird looking things. But uh, they're all out there, and, and it's, it's fun to be able to draw them and to be able to show people uh, what they might not otherwise be able to see. Uh, there's a new book coming out uh, this year, in about a month maybe, um, on whales, I've put every species of whale in it uh, that's alive today, so watch out for that one. And uh, sharks, I'm a huge fan of sharks. Dinosaurs and sharks are some of my favorite animals, and so uh, we did this book on sharks. And again, the, one of the reasons I love doing this work is because I get to bring the science into it, and, and it helps to be a tool uh, for education, so we can all learn about what's really fascinating, what's what's out there in the world today. So that's a white shark on the top left, and there's a, uh, a seven gill shark, uh, which is a weird one that we have here on the west coast, actually, all over the world too. Actually, so the other thing that that I really love to do with this kind of work is to be able to uh, paint pictures for museum exhibits, and this is what. What uh, Nick and Milana are, are so deeply involved in with their company is they, they prepare these exhibits for museums. And so I've had the pleasure to work with them and their friends on creating these big pictures called murals uh, for walls on museums so that when the public, and you, when you guys go to the museums and you see these pictures of, of what animals looked like uh, from long ago, it's uh, we paleo artists who are the ones who are uh, preparing these kinds of images. Sometimes they can be really big. Uh, sometimes they can be basically life-size. So these dinosaurs are almost as big as they would have been when they were alive. So this is one of the pictures that I did for the uh, Los Angeles uh, County Museum of Natural History, and this is a meningosaurus. And sometimes they can even be bigger than life. Uh, so this was at the opening uh, at the Smithsonian's uh, a Deep Time Exhibit at the National Museum of Natural History in Washington, D.C. They blew up one of these murals to even bigger than life uh, in the foreground. You can see all the people at the bottom like ants. Uh, and so it was kind of neat to see all of this at a size much, much bigger than I was working on. <laughs> um, so the neat thing about art for museums, and this piece here is, a, is one that my wife Alexandra and I did. Um, we collaborated together and we both painted it. Uh, it features Archaeopteryx, um, an, a dinosaur that um, was close to like the origin of birds, and it lived in a tropical uh, island kind of uh, region uh, in what is now Germany uh, millions of years ago in the Jurassic. And so we get to use all of this fascinating science and put it all together from many different uh, parts and, and make a picture from the result of the studies of many scientists. And, and we kind of fill in this picture of what life probably was like, and we get to kind of help people imagine what it was like to walk around in the Jurassic, for example. That's the point of this kind of artwork. But of course, you know, one of the things that, one of the questions that I get a lot 
is how do I know how to paint these prehistoric life forms? I mean, some of it is imagination. We don't have all of the information, but there's actually a lot that we can find out from uh, the application of science, of paleontology, of the work that these uh, hardworking paleontologists do. And this to me is really exciting because I get to work with these um, interesting things that they have found and I get to kind of work at the very end of their studies and put it all together and to make these pictures. So this is a Tyrannosaurus rex you might recognize. And um, the science can tell us something about the animal as well as its environment. So all of these plants you see here are also based on real plants that lived with it that we know from the fossil record. So one of the things, the first thing that we've seen from many, many different things is bones, right? We see tons of, of wonderful skeletal uh, remains, these, these bones of, of the, the animals that lived long ago. They're preserved best because they're hard. Uh, sometimes they're preserved together uh, in the original connections uh, that they had. And so, for example, I can tell that some animals had these, like this is our is dimetrodon and had this weird sail on its back made of these long rods of bone that stuck out. So that helps me to be able to draw a picture of this animal um, in, in an accurate, correct way of how it looked like when it was alive, at least how the skeleton shows that where the large parts of the body were held. Now, sometimes we can get really lucky and we can have more than just the skeleton. So you may have um, heard of uh, Mary Anning from long ago. Um, uh, who discovered some of the very first uh, fossils uh, of, of marine, of, of sea reptiles. Uh, and so she came across some of these interesting skeletons of, of that look like lizards from the, from the ocean, but also a little bit like dolphins. And if we're really lucky, sometimes a scientist will find the impression of the animal's soft body as well. So like the fins, the muscles, and so now we don't have to just guess at what the animal looked like just based on the skeleton, but we have information about how these soft parts also were on the animal. It takes really special conditions to preserve the fossils like this. So we're really lucky when we see these. And that helps me as a paleo artist to be able to draw pictures of them uh, more accurately in how they looked when they were alive. So this is an example of an ichthyosaurus, and this is probably pretty close to what it would have looked like in the oceans long ago in the Jurassic. Now, even more interesting than that, more than just the impressions of the outline of the animal, in some cases, we can actually get information about uh, other soft tissues like the skin of the animal or scales. And so this is an example of one one of these. This is a, um, a fossil of a Brachylophosaurus, long name, a uh, full name, Brachylophosaurus canadensis. And this is a special one that they found and it was mummified. So it had dried out and the muscles were preserved on the bones. Even the skin impressions were present there. Little dog is asking me to come up. Um, and uh, so this one here was really neat because we have pictures, uh, we have a, a um, fossils of its skin and the scales, the different sizes of scales from different parts of its body, these big scales on the legs, and these little scales on the side. And so I can use all of that to make a picture of the animal when it was alive or just had died. Um, and so that was, oh, and I have, I see somebody raising their hand there, I think. Or, or that maybe it was just a stretch. <laughs> okay, all right. <laughs> Okay, so, so that helps me as a paleo artist to put together an even more accurate picture of the animal. And then even more interesting than that sometimes, we have like bird-like dinosaurs or dinosaurs that have feathers. And the feathers can sometimes be preserved beautifully in the, um, the fossils as well uh, as impressions. You may have seen those, those beautiful pictures of Archaeopteryx, like the one I mentioned that my wife and I had uh, produced. Those ones were some of the first dinosaurs that were found and it had beautiful wing impressions of the feathers. Nowadays, we've all, some of the scientists have also found that things like this, on the left here, this large ostrich-like dinosaur uh, called Ornithomimus has these big plumes of feathers on its, on its arms, uh, like an ostrich kind of, and maybe they were used for displaying like ostriches do today, who knows? But um, we know that they had feathers on them. And I think that perhaps most interestingly and 
this is what I get a lot of, a lot of questions as, how do you know what colors dinosaurs bought? Well, the, some of the most fascinating discoveries by scientists have to do with color. And in some cases, we actually know what color some of these animals were. How is that? Because when paleontologists look using a microscope at some of the fossils of these animals, some of their feathers, they can actually tell based on some of those little small structures that, um, that it's made of what color they wear because they can compare those structures to those of today's birds. And uh, you can tell, for example, that the top one there, that microraptor, the black one, we know that it had a dark color, uh, mostly sort of blackish, and that it was iridescent. Or you know how when, when a feather, you rotate it in the light and it changes color and it kind of gets shiny and can change from black to green to blue and it changes color? That's iridescence. And you can tell by looking at the feather really close that it does that. And these dinosaurs actually were iridescent like that. Or at the bottom here, the sinus rothrix, uh, we know now that its tail had these rings of color of um, say like white and cinnamon alternating like that, kind of like a cat's tail. And so some of these are, are fascinating. Now, in some cases, I do guess at the colors of dinosaurs because we don't always have that information. I try my best. Uh, but in a few cases, I've painted an animal like this and Kiornis, I kind of guessed that of color red, because you know, we have lots of birds of different colors and dinosaurs may have been too. But then scientists came and, and actually did this really big study on it where they mapped out the colors on different parts of its body. And now we had information about what it actually looked like. And so I could change the, uh, the painting so that I updated it with real colors. And so now, this is actually very much, very probably what the animal actually looked like when it was alive with that sort of crest of red, reddish colored rusted, rusty color on its, on its head with the little spots of red on its cheeks. And then it was gray colored overall and then the wings had bands of black and white. Uh, and there may have been a few other colors in there as well, but we know something about how dark these parts were. And so this is, I think, fascinating to me to know what colors these animals were from, from many millions of years ago. It's, it's, it tells you something about how amazing science works. And it helps me. Now, in some cases, we still don't know what color some of these animals were. So what do we do as a paleo artist? What do I do to come up with colors for animals? Now, some of it is imagination, as I said. But then I also studied, in, in, when I was studying to be a scientist, I studied a science called ecology. And ecology talks about how animals uh, and plants interact with each other and their environment. And from that, we can tell from these studies, we can tell that animals often use color uh, to communicate with each other or to hide from their enemies, from either animals that are hunting them or animals that they want to hunt that they don't want to see them sneaking up on. And so here is a wonderful example of a gecko. This is a day gecko uh, in Hawaii. And on the left, you can see that when it's not in its natural environment, in this case, a, uh, a rusty uh, fence, uh, not, definitely not a natural environment, this, this gecko is a brilliant green. It just stands out uh, really brightly, and it's really easy to see it there, right? But you stick that bright green gecko onto its natural environment, these bright green leaves of a plant called pandanus, and it just almost vanishes. If you were walking through the forest, you could very easily miss that gecko because it is matching the bright green of, its, uh, of the leaves on which it lives. And so I use these kinds of ideas when coming up with color patterns for dinosaurs and other animals for which we don't have a lot of information. But for example, here you can maybe look for the dinosaur and uh, you probably, if you look around, you'll see on the bottom there, there's this uh, little dinosaur called Maylong that is curled up um, in a sleeping posture. And I actually painted it that way because there is a fossil known of this species where it's preserved in that exact posture. It's curled up with its head tucked uh, sort of under its wing, well, its arm, which is kind of like a wing, and its tail wrapped around its body. Uh, and it died like this uh, when a, a volcano spewed hot gases and, and, and poisonous gases over it and everything just kind of died suddenly, but it was preserved how it probably was sleeping. Anyway, so this guy, I was just kind of, the idea here was that, well, maybe it was sleeping on the ground with mosses and such, and so it, maybe a green coloration could have helped it to hide from predators while it was asleep, or who knows what. But this is an idea of how we can use colors to, to 
show that maybe dinosaurs used colors to hide from predators. In other cases, remember, birds of today are related to dinosaurs. They actually descended from dinosaurs. Um, and birds have these really elaborate um, courtship. Uh, you can see when, when birds are, are showing off to each other, they do all kinds of things, like birds of paradise will do these fancy dances. And so maybe dinosaurs of long ago, from millions of years ago, maybe they also did similar kinds of things. Maybe they did special dances to each other. Um, and so here I've shown a pair of long, long dinosaurs that are doing kind of a dance. And, and maybe, just like today's birds, some of them had these bright colors, maybe. Uh, and, and in those situations, they're doing the opposite of hiding. They're showing off, and so they want to be really bright for maybe to, for others of their species to notice them. Or sometimes to say that, hey, I'm dangerous. Maybe it's not worth your while to try to attack me, like many animals do today. Uh, here you have a triceratops um, and a tyrannosaurus facing them off. And um, they're both kind of brightly colored. Uh, and, and it's very possible that, that they might have been. We don't have this information yet on all of them. But, you know, this is one way in which they might have been. They might have been using their colors to show off. And speaking of animals uh, alive today, um, you might have seen in the little, uh, uh, my, my box up there before uh, Wiki up here, but you see the little animal at the very bottom there of this picture, that little mammal at the bottom right hand corner holding the shell in its hand. It looks almost like a little weasel. Well, that little animal is um, an ancient mammal, a uh, Dedelphodon. And the way I, I painted this one is that I used uh, the help of our little doggy, one of our little doggies, Wiki. And so she posed for me. And then I photographed her, and then I used that picture to help me to kind of guide the, the posture of, of somebody, because she has this, this cute thing she does where she begs. But it was perfect for the project. It was like I wanted to have one that was standing on its legs. And so she helped me to create this. And so she's now kind of a famous dog, and she appears on the blog of the Houston Museum's Na uh, Museum of Natural Science because of this. So she was involved in making these pictures. Uh, when she's not directly making pictures, she helps me in other ways too. So she keeps me company sometimes at my workstation um, where she'll sit in my lap for a while. And then sometimes she'll get tired and then, you know, she'll just snooze in my lap. So this is looking down uh, toward my keyboard and she's there in my lap on her little bed. So I have company while I, I work uh, and Wiki helps me that way. Uh, so that's basically how I do uh, what I do and how I apply science to this work of Pellior. I'm just going to show you a few pictures that I've done and show you, excuse me, <coughs> uh, different uh, kinds of, of, of media or, or the types of tools I use um, to, to create these work. So this picture here is a Parcaridontosaurus, and it was made using pencil crayons or colored pencils, exactly like the ones you have uh, on something called um, illustration board. It's basically like a thick paper. And so I love to work with pencil crayons. Um, they are wonderful to work with. And this is something that, that you probably do a lot of as well. And, and that you can use and that professional artists use as well to create artworks. But a lot of what I do and, uh, is, is done with a computer now. And so I have a drawing tablet, which looks like this. Um, and a, a stylus, which is kind of a pen, uh, but it's a digital pen, and then I can draw on the tablet. Uh, and that gets transferred directly into the computer, and I, I create a lot of these paintings that way. So this is a Tyrannosaurus. Uh, he's kind of harassing a bunch of uh, Quetzalcoatlus giant pterosaurs. And the, that, that previous one, this one is, is I do it using a, a, a few techniques where I, I've taken like thousands of shots of uh, photographs around the world. And then I use parts of these photographs to bring them together. And then I cut them out and change them and such. And I, I basically model an environment using these photograph pieces. And so it looks a little bit more photorealistic. But I also love to just kind of paint using um, that stylus I showed you, kind of like a paintbrush. This is also a digital uh, painting, but basically done the same way as if I were to hold a paintbrush and just kind of take paint and paint over a canvas. It's like one layer on top of another layer on top of another layer and so on. And then it's, I just build it up like that. And this is showing three early snakes uh, for which we have I, the, the, the authors who, who uh, the scientists who uh, commissioned this picture, who asked me to paint it, um, had ideas about snakes uh, early snakes that 
may have had, uh, would have had legs uh, at the time still, uh, before they evolutionarily lost them to what we have in modern snakes without any legs. So this was a fascinating little uh, study as well that they did. Here we have a picture of, of two uh, mammal-like animals, or proto mammals, or animals that are related to some early mammals, and they're kind of squabbling over another animal. This is way, way, way back, like well, more than 250 million years ago. So we're talking before dinosaurs. Uh, and I love to work with different uh, angles of viewing. So here we have this little guy in the bottom is only about as big as your cat. And uh, so we're kind of the hunkered down on the ground looking up and uh, trying to get to the same level as this little guy to see what his perspective of the world is like. And so that dinosaur that's jumping down from above from the fog is also not much bigger than a cat. But to this little guy, it's, it's, it's a bigger predator. So it's kind of like trying to imagine what the world looks like through the eyes of something that's different, that's smaller, let's say. Uh, it's also one of the things as an artist I love to do is work with, with creative lighting. Uh, so uh, have the sun come from unusual angles to make it more interesting, not just from straight above in a bright blue sky, but let's say sunset or sunrise when we have these beautiful colors that we can take advantage of. Because one of the things about paleo art is not just to make it look accurate, but you want it to be something that people want to look at. So it should have nice colors or an interesting kind of a look to it. And that's something that I, I try to do a lot. Uh, these are both pictures of these strange sailbacked animals from the Permian period. This one is Dimetrodon, the one before was Idaphosaurus. And uh, they lived alongside each other. And so it was, it was an interesting time when you had some of these strange sailbacked animals before the dinosaurs. And again, with unusual sort of angles, this one is, imagine you were lying on your back and, and your eyes could see in all directions around you, right? Uh, straight up and then in every direction as well. And so if you took all of that and, and put it into one picture, this is what you would see. This is uh, looking up at an apathosaurus uh, that is, is pushing down trees with its huge weight so that it can reach the leaves on top and sharing it with his friend over there. And yeah, that's also in the Jurassic. I don't just paint dinosaurs, I uh, paint other animals I live with them. This is a little lizard uh, related to many of them today that live in, in deserts. This is Guaragama. And there are some pterosaurs uh, in the background, these flying reptiles that are closely related to dinosaurs. And yeah, there were lots of other animals living with the dinosaurs and plants as well. Those are um, cycads in the background, similar to what we have today in some areas. These are all important parts of of, of, of the landscape, the prehistoric landscape that's, that I bring together from the studies of many different scientists. I love painting pictures underwater as well, or, or painting pictures of underwater. I don't actually paint underwater. It doesn't work so well with my uh, computer software, but I love painting pictures of what it would have been like to been, say, swimming with these animals. And so here we have a giant mosasaur. This guy is related to Komodo dragons and other uh, large lizards of today uh, distantly, but those are some of its closest living relatives. And uh, they look a little bit like them too, but these were huge. They were as big as killer whales or orcas of today, uh, or bigger even in some cases. And it's hunting some fish here, and some plesiosaurs in the background. And just like today, there were sharks around during the dinosaurs as well. Uh, this picture shows a group of sharks, and you can see also in the bottom left, if you're but you'll pick out there's also a mosasaur there, which is another one of those large reptiles related to Komodo dragons. But you can see up in the top left corner, you see those little streaks of light um, in, in the sky that you can see if you're looking through the water. But this is a picture um, that imagines what it was like right before the great big asteroid hit the Earth at the very end of the reign of dinosaurs um, at 66 million years ago. And so these are meteors that are streaking through the atmosphere and visible during the daytime. They're big. Uh, and behind them, you can't see it yet, but behind them, there's this giant asteroid that is heading toward the Earth that is maybe hours away. So it's the last bit of the Cretaceous period. So this is fun to be able to show these kinds of events through images and to tell a story. And, and uh, of course, a lot of you will be familiar with, uh, with uh, Clark Roque. Um, it's often just called Megalodon or Megatooth Shark. Uh, it's also now known as Pacutus Megalodon um, as its name is being revised scientifically. Uh, 
this was a giant shark that lived uh, only about four million years ago and uh, was alive at the same time that some of the early ancestors of uh, humans were walking the earth already. Um, and so this thing was giant. It was the size of a whale. So big. And this is not a gigantic elephant relative, but it's, it's still big enough. It's, it's bigger than a human. And so these things were, were enormous sharks. And so it's, it's amazing to be able to try to measure what they were like. But here's, um, the, uh, I'm, let me just go back. This is going to be just a, a, a sort of a little lapse video showing how it looks like when I start a picture and then uh, add details more and more to it until it's finished. So watch as it changes here and you'll see as I add paint to different parts of it. So there it goes. You can see it develop as I add, this is like a speed, high speed um, fast forward of, of, of my work on it. This whole thing took about a month to do. This was the cover of one of the books that I did that shows uh, my artwork. And you can see how I add more detail to different animals and then I change the background. I add trees and I add more animals and then some of the small plants in the foreground, mist in the background, the clouds and the lightning uh, and, and all the final details and then it's finished. So it, it kind of slowly comes together from all the different parts of it gradually and then it can take quite a while. But that's basically what it looks like. So one of the things that paleo art can do is also sort of help us to imagine what we might find uh, in the future. And this is another way that in some cases it might help science as well. It helps us to kind of come up with ideas. So this is a picture I did of, um, have you heard of the material called amber? It's like fossilized tree sap. So it flows out of a tree and then if it uh, sits around for a long, long, long time, it can fossilize, harden, and become this gemstone that today we call amber. And sometimes, uh, as Jurassic Park uh, like to feature in, 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 in that movie, you know, it'll, it will contain parts of animals like insects, for example, or leaves, or, or, or feathers, or, or, or fur, or whatever, parts of animals, and it preserves them beautifully well. It's like looking through a window in time. Um, and we find all kinds of fascinating little animals, in them. insects, small mammals, but what are some fascinating things that we could imagine we might find in amber in the future? Well, we've already found little bits of animals like tails or, or legs of, of, of birds or dinosaurs, but what if, and here's, here's a thought, maybe if we find a big enough piece, we might even find something in it that would be more unexpected. Like for example, what if we were to find like a, a, a whole baby Tyrannosaurus? <laughs> and this was kind of a, a, sort of an idea I was just kind of playing around with. But you know, you never know. If there, there are pieces of amber that are really big and a baby Tyrannosaurus was only about that big. So it's, it's theoretically possible if you could have had a large amount of sap collect somewhere, maybe this dinosaur got stuck in it, who knows? I mean, just last week there was um, uh, some news about a, a head of a small reptile that was found um, in amber. And so there, it's, it's in the news today already now. And so there's all sorts of interesting ideas that could come up out of this. Um, and so paleo art, scientific art uh, is helpful to you know, maybe help science come up with ideas sometimes, and then we use science to create our images. And so basically that kind of gives you an idea of what I do as a paleo artist and, and find it to be extremely fun.